I think there's some real opportunities out there in the market, but I think the fortunes for the, in the next five years are going to be built by people who figure that problem out in a really clever way because, look, we've, we've exhausted the, the model that built the Kings, that built the Supercells, that built the Rovios. What's up, guys? Uh, welcome to the first episode of Secret Stash. This is Stash's new podcast where we go inside the gaming industry. My name is Justin Kahn, co-founder of Stash. Previously, I was the co-founder of Twitch. I've been an investor in uh, tech and the games industry. And I'm joined by my co-host, Archie Stonehill, head of product of Stash. Yep. Uh, Archie's head of product of Stash. Before joining Stash, I was uh, an investor in the games industry um, at a fund called Makers Fund for five years. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I linked up with these guys in about six months ago to help build Stash. Pulled you out for a much less lucrative job. Well, we'll see. In the <laughs> much more, maybe. We'll see. Much higher risk. And um, today, our first guest uh, joining us is Mitch Lasky, um, legendary entrepreneur in the games industry and investor. He built, helped build Activision. And then after that, CEO of Jamdat, which he sold for $680 million. Not a small amount. And then had a second career as an investor at Benchmark, where you've invested in Riot, amazing game um, studio, and uh, Snapchat, and uh, Discord. Yep. On the board of Discord. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank Anything you we so missed? much. No, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, a few investments. No, you <laughs> say, yeah, just yeah. a few. Yeah. You could say a few more. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so, yeah, we're going to dive into a bunch of stuff in the games industry. But before we do that, I have a question that I've always been dying to ask you, and I don't think I've ever asked you. Shoot. Uh, which is in the early days of Twitch, like when we first started, um, there was one investor that we wanted to get. I remember my co-founder and our CEO, Emmett, yep. uh, went and talked to every investor in Silicon Valley, and most of them were just like, what is that? People watching other people stream video games, that doesn't make any sense, that's not a thing. In fact, we had one um, landlord who wouldn't even rent us an office because they were like, your company's not real. And... Um, but there was one investor he really wanted. I remember he was like, he met you and he was like, this guy gets it. He's the only investor who gets it. We need to get Mitch invested. And then you passed. I did. <laughs> so can you just tell me why, please? Yeah. So, um, you know, at the time, the only business model that Emmett could articulate about <laughs> how he was going to monetize Twitch. And, and I don't need much, right? I just need a hint of a business model. Um, that I can wrap my arms around and then I can work. I can, I felt like I could come in and work and coach and do the stuff that I usually do, but he really didn't have any idea of how he was going to monetize it. I mean, he was like, yeah, I guess we'll run ads was basically the answer at that time. And I could imagine all kinds of really interesting businesses. And I was just coming out of, you know, the Snapchat situation where being invested in a subscale advertising business <laughs> was tricky, yeah. right? Like it was tricky to justify value in that kind of a business. And it proved, it's proved to be tricky. To this day. So um, I was really concerned about getting myself into another potential subscale advertising uh, business. And um, what I, where, this is a mistake I often make in the, in, in the investing business, which is I miss the strategic forest for the operational trees. And in that case, like I didn't, I just didn't think it would be of strategic value to a company like Amazon, for example, yeah. um, that was willing to buy it essentially in the absence of a really mature business model. Yeah. Um, and I made the same mistake on Oculus, right? Like I had a, I had a clean shot at that before any other investor in the Valley. Um, Brendan, who was the founder, had worked for me at Gaikai and um, I had advised him on Scaleform, his previous business. And I just couldn't wrap my arms around the VR thing as a potential business and missed the whole idea that Facebook would pay $2 billion just to own it for fun. Yeah. And then just invest. 10 more billion. Yeah, yeah. or more. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I would say, I mean, look, Twitch, I think, still has some innovation to do on the business model. Yeah. Right? I, I do think that, there, that there's still some really interesting avenues that they could explore that they haven't really explored in particular. Yeah. But the thing is, those networks are so durable. Like, we, we forget how durable <laughs> they really are. Like, yeah. we, you know, you think from the outside, you're like, oh, well, Elon takes over Twitch and starts 
fucking it. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, swear, swear away. Um, Elon Twitter. takes over Twitch Twitter. and starts fucking with it, and like you know, it, 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 and and everyone's like, oh, Twitter's over. Yeah, and it's like, nah, that like those network effects are really durable, and like we've seen that at Discord certainly, where um, you know w- we've made a few positive steps and a few missteps, and regardless. We still are on a growth trajectory and our MAU and DAU keep increasing, you know, over time. And I think Twitch has had a similar kind of situation where sure. with, yeah. even in the absence of really significant innovation, that audience is <laughs> damn durable. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that to Emmett. Even in the absence of significant innovation, we built a durable business. Hey, um, you know what? <laughs> it was, I mean, it's true because after we sold it to Amazon, you know, Microsoft, Google, Pile like they plowed like almost a billion dollars, I think, into trying to buy content to build their own networks oh, yeah. and failed to capture the US market. Yeah, and now Justin got that off his chest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry to go a little long on the yeah, why no, did you pass perfect. on that's Twitch perfect. thing? But uh, I think Emmett might have some follow ups now, though. Based I'm going to send him this clip. Yeah. Twitch, yeah. it's an interesting business. It's a, it, I, I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, we have some questions about uh, games and, and some. We thought we'd kick off with uh, something you said on your podcast, GameCraft, which yep. I would recommend everyone listen to. It's, it's by far the best content out there. And if you're trying to understand like the deep dynamics of the games industry. Um, so you, in the episode on distribution, you were talking about, I think, mobile specifically. Yes. Um, and mobile really has like an arbitrage between CPI and LTV, and that's core to the mobile business model. And you described it as gross. You said it wasn't for me. I'm curious kind of what you meant by that. and and. Um, yeah, if you could explain a little bit what you find about that. Sure. Well. I, and by the way, I, was, I wasn't describing, even though I do find the, the sort of CAC, uh, you know, LTV, CPI-based type business slightly gross. Like, I don't yeah. love um, paid user acquisition as a core competency necessarily of a business, fundamentally. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I was really referring to was more the kind of advertising-supported very lightweight gameplay that you see ho- commonly in the hyper-casual yeah. business, right? Where the intention is to amuse someone for a very short period of time and then, but keep them moving to the next game in your family and, um, and just to throw advertisements at them and monetize it that way. And I think that business, obviously the bottom has fallen out of that business to a large degree as it has fallen out of the CPI business. I mean, I was looking at a company the other day um, that I'm very familiar with, not a company I'm invested in or one that I would consider investing in, but they were showing me their current return on investment numbers for their ad spending. And it was shocking. I mean, it was literally 10 cents on the invested dollar was the revenue that they were, that they, that they were expecting. To, like they said they had to stop advertising because they couldn't justify it anymore. And so in that kind of an environment, I think w- w- the whole, we as an industry, we have to get out of that, um, that circling drain, if you will, of, you know, paid user acquisition as the, as, as the model, because basically then you're encouraging bad behavior the games that can then generate enough revenue to reinvest back into that, into that model to get more downloads than to, you know, squeeze a little bit of additional monetization out of it so they can plow that money back in. Um, I I don't think it ultimately serves the audience in the end. So what do you think the the future is then for acquisition or like where should game companies be looking or trying to invest? I think it's the central problem of the games industry right now, right? I think the, and, and I think the solutions to that problem are going to generate like outsized returns in in ter- for in terms of investment in terms of of shareholding i think there's some real opportunities out there in the market but i think the fortunes for the in the next 5 years are going to be built by people who figure that problem out in a really clever way because look we've we've exhausted the the model that built the kings that built the supercells that built the rovios um which yeah, was really 10 years of yeah, paid acquisition and spend and, and plow that money back in that also always favors the incumbents because like cost of capital and how long you can afford to have your paybacks is you know such an important factor in that and so playtica can afford three-year paybacks you know some smaller startup can't and so it doesn't lend itself to disruption i think as well true and also i think it favors intellectual property holders clearly yeah. right because the, if you're if, if you if a lot of these companies are using you look at monopoly go yeah. or you look at marvel snap or yeah. other things like that they're using that intellectual property as, as essentially a customer acquisition tool right they're getting placement they're getting uh users to essentially pick it off the virtual shelf 
because of its brand association. And so I think that also favors the incumbents because they typically have the strongest IP portfolios. Totally, I did, and they can afford the MGs. I did an analysis that is one of my most useful, I think, where I look at the number of games that enter the top 100 grossing for the first time in a year. And first of all, that cratered from 21 to 22. But I think 70% plus of them were IP games. Really? Yeah. It was That's like interesting. Doom game. Yeah, 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 which was up. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah. I, uh, I think, though, that one kind of final question on this, can you separate like a marketing innovation from a product innovation? Or don't you think there's some kind of inherent link between a hyper casual style, oh, we're making our gameplay marketing oriented versus like a pure play, oh, we found a way to acquire customers cheaper, which I think is more indefensible? I don't know. I, I, I have always tr tried to keep the faith that there was a path to market for quality, right? That, that at some point, quality sort of finds its audience. I think that's decreasingly true in the modern business, and, and, I, and, and that makes me sad. Um, but I do kind of have that as an article of faith, right? That like, if you can make something that's really good, um, people will find it, people will talk about it, and ultimately, in some way, it will find an audience if you can kind of keep it buoyant long enough. Um, I think, in, obviously, as we're, you know, the, the businesses that are the most reliant on what I would call the grossest business models, and you're to, to, if you want to you, you you bring that up, um, are, are precisely the ones that, that have the least ability to, to achieve what I just discussed, which is like that, that sort of quality finding its own, its own path. A lot of times these are like very hard to distinguish between casino, casual casino games, for example, yeah. or oh. match three games or other things like that. And not, not to say that there aren't high quality match three games, which we were talking before we got started about dream. And I think they are like the Picassos of yes, the match clearly, three yeah, of yeah. the match three game. But regardless, uh, you know, th those are very hard to differentiate on the basis of quality for most users. And so I think those are areas where spending and branding and IP and other things like that, I think, have more significance. Um, this actually ties really well to the next question we have, which is, I think you're a great champion of thinking more about distribution when you think about product and uh, when you think about disruption and innovation. And, um, you know, I think a lot of discourse like over indexes on product innovation to, and undermines uh, to, to the neglect of distribution. But could you maybe talk a bit about how, especially in your experience, Product innovations and distribution innovations kind of have to go hand in hand. For, so, for example, something like Riot, like mm -hmm. how did the MOBA and Riot's go to market strategy, like it relate to one another? Sure. And just to take a step back, I think the reason I'm so obsessed with distribution, um, maybe unnaturally obsessed with distribution, is because having come from the content side of the business, yeah. having been essentially a creative executive, um, green lighting projects and trying to find their way to market. Um, I'm hyper aware of just how much of the success dependency was based on the way we, we did it, the way we took a particular product to market, whether it was a particular marketing campaign, an initial audience, et cetera, those things really like grease the slide. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and then we could really achieve the kind of liftoff because for a lot of these modern games, you're really trying to get enough user liquidity into, into the product where there's something fun happening when somebody shows up to, to play and it's not too intimidating. It's not too hard. The noobs don't feel like they're going to be killed immediately when they, when they move into the game, et cetera. And in order for that to happen, you need a lot of, and a diversity of user liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. And so achieving that first million users, let's say, or first half a million users is something I obsess about with particular with my, with my portfolio in particular. And so there's a number of ways to solve that problem. Uh, in the Riot case, for example, they were cloning Defense of the Ancients. They were, it, was, it was effectively a mod of Defense of the Ancients. Um, and what they did was they co-opted the Defense of the Ancients mod community. Yeah. So in, in, in a very intentional way, they reached out to the community. They hired members of the community and brought them in-house to be community leaders that would then go out and manage forums. They appeared... Uh, you know, in the forums, yeah. we very surreptitiously and quietly acquired, uh, you know, websites and other community uh, loci that we could use to very subtly focus editorial attention on the upcoming smash hit League of Legends. Um, and at the same time, we were building, again, in, in those days, we were building our own backend, our own server backend. Um, and 
for some unknown reason, they had started that process building a Windows NT server cluster, <laughs> um, which was madness, right? And so um, that was one place where I had to, I sort of laid on the boardroom table and said, we can't go to mark, we have to switch to a, to a Linux based cloud in order to go to market. And then of course that made perfect sense because they could, they could leverage that into the real cloud when, when, when they needed to. But yeah, no, it was the, the, the path to market for League of Legends. Obviously, all of these things, you know, you, the successes, you look in the rearview mirror and you're like, oh, you know, it was all buttercups and roses all the way along. And it's like not the case. And, but did you, did you have, did they have that marketing map when you invested? Absolutely. That was in the pitch, basically. Gotcha. They were like, and, and of course, they, I think they somewhat overstated it, but you know, whatever, that's, that, that's, that's the business we've chosen. I think they said there were 11 million Dota players, right, who they, who they thought they could, they could bring on board. And you know, it, look, it turned out that they, there, there were many, many more League of Legends players yeah, than yeah. 11 million. So, um, so in some ways, they may have understated the opportunity, but uh, I, was, I, would, I was like, look, I'm going to discount this by 90%. If they could even get, um, if there's even a million that's enough. That's enough of a push into the market to, to give this Which thing a chance right. of success. A million, I think, is right. Yeah. As well, the number. Why did they, do you think they won against, there were other kind of people trying to do the same thing. Like, Not really. They, they, that came mostly North. later. That was, that was later. Yeah, yeah it came later. Really? Okay. Yeah. That was, that, that essentially what happened there was, the, there were two people responsible for the, the, the mod, as I, re, as I recall, the, the original Dota, the Warcraft 3 mod. Yeah. And they, we, we, had one of them on, on in our in our camp, and the other one went off and did he Heroes. Gotcha. And Heroes came out premium. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious because what you mentioned earlier about accessibility for player liquidity at varying stages, I thought it was a very interesting point because one of the things that League has, as opposed to some of the other MOBAs like um, you know Dota, for example, Dota Two, is um, arguably like a more team oriented gameplay that allows perhaps allows new players to come in a, to a cohort that already includes experienced Dota players. Mm -hmm. And so it strikes me that there were probably design decisions that were made in order to account for the fact, okay, we're going to have a community of really cool players who know this game mode, who are coming from the mod, and we want to bring new people in. So we have to design the game to account for that. Yep. I think that's partially true. I think it was maybe a little bit of an accident of the design to a certain extent, okay. because I do think it was designed to be quite core. Yeah. Right. And not to, uh, it, I, I don't think the idea of accommodating diverse teams with different okay. skill levels was as important to them as super serving the core. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they, they knew that, they, that their reputation, essentially, their, the, the PR that would help bring in the next 5 million users um, was going to be dependent on them having high credibility and high affinity from the, the, from the corest of the core. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, right now, for, most developers, you have, you know, most of the distribution is on these big platforms, Apple's, yeah. Google's, Steam, Steam. et cetera. Yep. And what you can do distribution wise is pretty limited. And so I'm kind of curious how you think about like for you know, practical advice for developers who are thinking about how to get to market and like what dimensions they can even, you know, iter like innovate on. Yeah. So I look at this as like a big surface area, yeah. basically, and, and, and as big horizontal surfaces. And when I look at, let's, let's just take them one by one, right? Mm -hmm. So when, you look at, when I look at the console business, what I love about the console business is that it's an extremely high affinity payer, right? Like yep. the, the, the Venn diagram of people who are willing to pay $70 for a product and, the number, and pay $500 for a console is very high yeah. in terms of overlap. And so... Um, I think there you are going to find very high sort of pay if it, payment affinity. And we see this borne out like in, in some of these wonderful litigation disclosures that we've been getting in the video game business, like whether it's, you know, email dumps from Microsoft or like the, the discovery in the Apple Epic case, et cetera. These have been a goldmine yeah. for students of the industry like me who dig through that stuff and find all of these, this cra these crazy numbers that they would never want to disclose publicly in any other context. And, and what we found was that like, such a high percentage of Epic's uh, revenue was coming really from PlayStation, yeah. right? And, and it should make sense to us, again, for that very reason. It's like, th that is self-selection, right? If you're, if you're playing Fortnite on the PlayStation, you have self-selected, right? Because you can afford the PlayStation and you can, yeah. afford to, you can afford to pay. So I think 
in, in that case, I think you can, you can look at that customer kind of differently than you look at, let's say, a mobile customer who's very used to playing things for free, very high uh, friction in terms of that initial purchase, like getting somebody to pay a dollar or two dollars or something sight unseen without trial, much more difficult in mobile. Yep. And so I think you need a different approach in mobile. Um, and that's why I really like free to play in the mobile context, because I think it, it plays to the strengths and weaknesses of the platform. Yeah, it, it really plays to the... And I think PC is somewhere in the middle. And I think one of the problems is that, and I think this is one of the tensions that we're seeing played out in all of this litigation, which is that like there's a mismatch in terms of value um, between the, what the platforms are charging for access to customers, basically, or, or access to revenue, and what they're actually doing in terms of, of assisting you with with identifying and acquiring those yeah. those customers with high payment affinity and so for example like you know on 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 steam or whatever or on mobile they're you're kind of left to your own devices right it's like <laughs> yeah. you don't get a whole lot of help from the platform and at the same time the platform isn't really helping you identify customers with high willingness to pay either so i think um i think that friction that tension is behind a lot of the current uh, disruption that's going on in and around the distribution uh, part of the business. We see that speaking to developers, and I think Steam even, I mean, Steam is very important for organic discovery on yeah. PC, whereas Google and Apple, like, not only do they not help, I mean, they, they're exactly. charging you for the ad space, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and letting your competitors, you know, buy yeah. your search terms and stuff. Well, how do you think the, the regulatory kind of environment changing might change that for developers or i think it's going to be useful on the mobile side i yeah. think um any kind of diversity we could introduce into the platform on the on the mobile side is going to be great um i think it may initially be only available to already incumbent players because they're the only ones who could really afford uh to do to do it essentially at, at the kind of scale that's going to be necessary because if you kind of parse the apple math yeah. It's very, it, would, it would seem to me to be very difficult for an, indi an indie to do it, right? I think it may lead to some interesting new business models. So, for example, uh, you know, a, a, a new pub, a new kind of publisher who could aggregate enough content and therefore uh, audience in order to justify uh, having their own store, right? Um, and I think that we're going to see more openness on the PC side of the equation as well. And with that, I think, you know, I think there could be some really interesting opportunities to build some new businesses that don't currently exist that can slot into that new environment in a profitable way. The, the PC side's interesting as a contrast to mobile because, you know, with mobile, you were like forced to download through the Apple Store or the Google Store pretty much. Uh, but with PC, users have opted into Steam because they have the best community product aggregation of titles. Like, what do you... How, what do you think is going to change in the PC side specifically? I think Steam is still going to be extremely relevant for that very reason. I mean, yeah. I, I, just the convenience of Steam um, and the network effect that's created by the fact that, that everybody ends up putting their content on there eventually. And so yeah. you, it sort of serves as a way to manage your licenses to all of your content. It's kind of a one-stop shop yeah. um, where like a, you know, a record bin or something where you can go through and just see all your stuff. I, that's very powerful. And I think it's, it's more durable, I think, than, than, than we think. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I think Steam still maintains uh, that position. Whether or not they can continue to take the, the rake that they're taking on content distribution is uncertain. And I think that may come under some pressure. And I think that their more recent move to a much more open, less curated platform where, where just it, you know, access to, to the Steam platform now is so easy. I think it's diminishing that discovery piece of their um, yeah. pitch. Interesting. Right? I think, I think it's diluting their ability to concentrate users on particular products outside of their featuring. And that may, that may be a very interesting sort of thing to watch downstream because I think that may call into question the value proposition and open the door for, other, for others to come in and compete. I think that if you, I mean, I do think it's really interesting to contrast where the, where the major innovations in games have come from in the last 10 years. Say arguably the three big, most innovative, disruptive Western game developers, Riot, 
um, uh, Fortnite and Epic uh, and Roblox, right? Yep. Those three business models and distribution pods and kind of company theses were only possible to start on PC. Yep. Um, and then they slowly expanded elsewhere. But one of the real challenges with these stores isn't just the rake, it's the restrictions, right? Yes. I mean, Roblox is clearly a violation of the store within its store policy. It was just too big, right? right? Um, but on Steam, um, uh, the other thing Steam's done is build a lot of back-end tooling that developers yep. rely on now. So they might invest in that for stickiness. Yeah, and look, you can see this very sharply in the, in the Epic store versus Steam. Um, Epic has come to market with uh, 18% lower rake than steam and yet it doesn't seem to have mattered right no. so clearly the developers are finding some value on steam that even transcends the fact that they're getting they're losing almost 20 percent of their revenue to the platform in the process yeah. so there has to be something of of tremendous value there to encourage that because obviously epic can certainly focus eyeballs on the platform I mean, they have 200 million monthly users or more 225 million monthly users it's like they, they clearly have enough of an audience that if they wanted to focus it down on particular content, they could. And yet, you know, we're seeing the lethal companies, the PAL worlds, those things launching on Steam still, despite the 30% rake. That, that thing, I think if you think of who Epic's eyeballs are, it's Fortnite players. And maybe they're not in the market for the indie titles that Steam players are. Could be. Yeah. Um, Although if that's the case, then it's going to be interesting to watch UEFN. Yeah, yeah, they might be more open, but I think that UEFN still captures the social graph that Fortnite benefits from. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I could go on about that for a while, but we'll we'll move on to another question, which is related. Which is, if you look at the major incumbent like AAA game devs, including your former employers, they've they've been quite bad at doing their own direct consumer channels. EA Origin, Ubisoft Connect, uh, Battle.net on a great client. Like, why do you think that is? Why have they struggled? Um, from my own experience, I think they, they just are not internet native. And I think you kind of have to be internet native in a way to make it work, right? I think it's one of the, the reasons Twitch worked, right? Yeah. It's like you guys were all like <laughs> you guys were all in this from Justin TV, from everything that, you, that had gone before. There was, a, there was a real understanding of the milieu that I don't think exists at all. Um, and certainly didn't exist at the time when it was most crucial for them to know this stuff, which was around 2004, 2005. Because there was a moment in time there. I mean, I was at Electronic Arts uh, on the management team in, two, they bought my company in late 2006, so in two, starting in 2007. And like, I took over mobile and online there. And the online side of, of, of the company was incomprehensible, right? Like, I, everybody was running their own database of users. Everybody had their own... Like every mini studio, like the Madden team, the FIFA team, the Sims team, they all had their own strategy. There was no unified strategy. And they, they actually tasked me with kind of cleaning up their online, the, their notion of online, basically. And I went and looked at everything, and it was such a mess that I literally came back to the senior management team and gave a presentation in which the first slide was a shipping container. And I was like, this is the model for what we need to do to solve the problem. And they were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, we just need to know how many Madden customers are also Sims customers. We need to know how many FIFA customers are also Battlefield customers. Like, we just need to know our customer a little bit better. And we need to do that through a very simple sort of like online presence. Like, let's not get real fancy. They were like, they wanted to jump to square 10. And I was like, no, let's just go to square two. And we called it Nucleus because we, because good fancy name things tend to get funded better inside of big companies. And it took them, and then I left and went to benchmark and it took them six additional years oh, man. to do that incredibly simple idea. Really shared identity? Yeah. yeah. Six years. And so you ask, why did they have so much trouble competing? It's because they move at the speed of cattle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, so maybe moving on to like a different kind of set of topics here. Um, uh, which really touch on supply and demand and particularly with some funding um, related questions. I think it's clear you've seen, you did Riot when, 2008? Nine. 2009, yeah. yeah. It seems like uh, the VC industry kind of looked at that investment in 2009 
2018 and was like, oh, that was a good idea. Let's replicate it. Uh, and so you've seen a lot of funding of kind of ex-Riot employees getting very, very significant amounts of money to, to try and do what Riot did again. Um, and I think more broadly, you've seen an oversupply of service game content as a result of the, you know, the funding that's available being equity incentivized. Yeah. Um, have you thought much about, is there an innovation to be done in funding models to try and serve what seems like a like supply demand thing with premium game supply? Not really. I have to say, um, you know, I do, I do agree with you, by the way. Like, I, th I think that did kind of happen. Um, I, I would say it was a little bit less deterministic yeah. in, in a way that it was more, um, you had a flood of new investors come into the market, mostly people who had either been, you know, like you had been on, on, the, on the, the, the banking or consulting side, yeah. Or you had people who were biz dev people at like some major studios or others who who suddenly were like partners at venture firms, right? And um, they didn't have like you know they, like in in the two thousand nine era, it, it was just swashbuckling in the games business. It was me and Bing yeah. Gordon, right? From like, my friend from Electronic Arts, and we were kind of it, right? He did great deals like Zynga, um, and so you know, when it got kind of professionalized, if you will, and, and suddenly instead of just being two dudes who were loosely affiliated with large venture capital firms, it, it suddenly became, you know, game specific funds, Bitcraft, Makers, you know, Griffin, other companies like that. Um, I think that the, 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 I wouldn't say risk tolerance necessarily, but like Th these younger investors who had less immediate credibility looking at and evaluating games at the design stage, which is a key, key, like, skill that you need to do what I do or what Bing did well, right? Which is to be able to look at stuff on paper or in a pitch and understand the risks, understand the opportunities. I think a lot of those people devolved into a credentialist mentality and said, this guy worked at Riot or this woman worked at Blizzard or whatever, and they should get money for that reason alone because they'll probably come up with something cool because they've been touched by the magic. <laughs> and we know, we laugh because we've been in the games business long enough to know how, how nonsensical that notion is. And the thing is, it's a broken clock strategy because it will work occasionally, yeah. right? But it won't work for the reason that it's that it was that, that people do it, which is the assumption that there's a direct relationship between those credentials and quality. But it's also, you know, the next riot won't be riot, right? I mean, it, it's it's like uh, the best VC investments are not, I would say, replicatable in the same kind of way. And so there doesn't seem to have been a questioning of like, okay, well, why did riot succeed? Um, and is that still like a um, kind of condition set that exists? Right. And I think people, and I've tried to tell the truth about this as much as I possibly could, that it was this combination of an extremely passionate team focused on customer quality and engagement with a distinct distribution advantage yeah. and a business model that was amenable to scale, right? Okay, that's a complicated thought, but like, do you see a lot of other people chasing that? No, not really, right? It's like maybe they'll get the, the, the team part of it or maybe they'll get the product part of it or whatever, but they don't understand that it's the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the synthesis of those things that really creates the value. Yeah, yeah. That, and I, I think I got quite frustrated that about this as an investor because I was in Europe doing a lot of mobile stuff and looking at mobile, and I think that particularly American VCs have, have, have often neglected mobile, um, which I think is maybe less of a kind of, sphere of true kind of business model innovation and 10 billion dollar outcomes but has been a more sustained more um a reliable and i would say consistent creator of equity value in the games industry yeah it's interesting i would i would say guilty as charged like i, I myself have been somewhat neglectful of mobile despite having been a mobile game yeah, entrepreneur you were, you were, you were too early, yeah. <laughs> right i'm like that's where i made my, my my first real money was as a as a mobile game publisher but um i think it was the the that business model of, you know, taking the revenue, last month's revenue and plowing 110% of it into next month's revenue generation through customer acquisition spending, that was frightening to a lot of traditional VCs, myself included, right? That business model was absolutely foreign to the way I thought about the games business, right? Yeah. And at the same time, we had seen a lot of internet specific businesses that were 
based on paid customer yeah. acquisition, just crater like like significantly. And so um, the idea that you could have a company like a huge or something like that, where, I mean, I looked at huge early on and the P&L literally frightened me. Like I looked at the thing and I was like, this kit, like you're doing a hundred million in top line and you're spending 92 million on customer acquisition. <laughs> like that, that was, that was just, an, uh, it was out of my experience. And I think it was out of the experience of a lot of potential investors. And I think it did benefit the kind of mobile natives in the Nordics, in the UK, and in some of the other countries. Well, I, I, want to, I came from consulting and private equity. And so I wonder if, yes, they're very capital intensive businesses, but that kind of like, this math isn't that hard. They're acquiring users this much. If we just give them some money, they can scale, like made some logic to me. But you did make one mobile investment that has turned out pretty well that I wanted to ask about, which is that game company. Yeah, I did two. I, one, I had yeah. another one that did pretty well, which is Natural Motion. Yeah, Natural which Motion, of Zynga course. Yeah. acquired for like 700 million bucks. But I'm really curious about uh, that game company because this is a studio with like inarguably one of the genius designers out there, Janelle yep. Chan, who had made, who, who was an archetypal premium game studio, right? Journey Flow. And you invested in 2012. Yep. Um, uh, I, I assume on what ultimately became Sky, which was again, yes. they released seven years later. It's been hugely successful. Can you talk a bit about that investment? Sure. So I've known Genova for many years um, since he was a student at USC. Um, we had a, an interesting idea to build kind of a gladiatorial combat game based on the creature creation I was model. Say, yeah, that's where I remember uh, it. Um, and it was, and and uh, and that was kind of a, the best we could do. But in the meantime, we saw uh, fl we saw flow from uh, from Genova, which was essentially spore. I mean, it was like a you know paramecia eating little bugs and then growing and then eating another bug and growing in a particular way. And like, I don't know if you've ever played it, but it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really incredibly cool. So I tried to recruit him and he was way too smart for that and was like, no, I'm not going to work for you. And, but then when he finished his relationship with Sony on journey, which was fraught yeah, um, and it. involved a lot of maxing out of credit cards and <laughs> that kind of stuff in order to get the game across the finish line. Uh, I think he had felt hard done by, as they say in your country. And um, he came to me and said, hey, can you help me? I want to do this next studio venture back so that I could have a little bit more elbow room and a little bit more uh, opportunity to create the kind of game I think will succeed in this market. And I was like, yes, but. And the but was you can't make a single player adventure game, yep. right? You're going to have to make a game as a service. And I will help you think it through and it will be natural and organic to your genius but you can't make a single player adventure game. And that was kind of our bargain. And we went from there and it took us seven or eight years to get it to market and many, many, uh, much testing and, and iteration. Um, and then it, it did just astonishingly well. Yeah. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. But yeah. the thing is that, that literally hundreds of millions of dollars in profit in free yeah. cash flow. <laughs> Because it probably didn't have the CPI. Exactly. Yeah. Like no, literally almost none. We saw lots of pitches though, and I think this is because the funding that's available incentivizes this of premium game designers kind of being like, I'm we're gonna, I'm gonna and it's gonna be a service game because VCs wanna hear that. And so they adapt. And so how did you get conviction that this kind of craftsman designer would be able to make a service game that monetized with microtransactions? I asked. <laughs> I, I engaged him in a conversation, right? I, I tested him and he tested me. And we, we saw that we could find that there was a meeting of the minds okay. that, we could, that we could reach where um, I, I had a little bit of inherent knowledge from, from Riot and from just as an industry observer for many, many, many years. And obviously he brought his own genius yeah. to the party. And I, I was like, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll help you in the ways that I can and you'll mold this in the way that you can. But I think the core was his understanding of the business models. And he's sophisticated enough to realize that, yeah, it's like getting someone to play your game and then the, the long-term engagement mechanic is getting them to play it again is not really a viable proposition, right? Like you have to build a, a sandbox. You have to build an evolving universe with content that can be added later and where you can move the product in various directions to continue to engage and accommodate those users. And you can't do that with a single player adventure. Even yeah. though I have played Journey more than once, I wouldn't consider that a long-term engagement model. Yeah. I could go on about that, but maybe one final question, which is monetization though. How did that, how did Genova feel about that? He had very particular um, opinions about it and okay. it had to be done in a way that was as altruistic as possible. 
Um, and that was a challenge, as you can imagine, yeah. um, because most of the existing antecedents that we could look to as examples were predatory. Yeah. And so we couldn't do that. We had to do something that, was, that, that fulfilled his intention of positive emotion. Yeah. Right? We didn't yeah. want to create a monetization system that generated negative emotion. And so there's a lot of gifting. There's a lot of altruism. There's a lot of success through cooperation yeah. and other things like that. In order to, you have to do an act of altruism in order to gain access to chat in game. Yeah. So that you can't just walk up to somebody and start abusing them, right? In order, in, order to, in order to do so, you have to have paid for something and given it to them. And then you can have a social interaction with them, right? And so it's all kinds of little things like that. that and, and he's a craftsman, and he thinks about all of those things. Yeah. Uh, the uh, a question about AAA titles, Activision published over 20 games, and then you know, in 2020, they published five games. Yeah. And so is it, I'm curious, what do you think the outlook looks like? Of, you know? I am still bullish on AAA. I'm not bullish on the current AAA business model. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not bullish on the like, you know, 500 people campaign to build these games, you know, that cost half a billion or a billion dollars to bring to market. Uh, I was talking to a very senior executive in the business this morning for breakfast who told me about a game that was a sequel to an existing game brought to market by the same developer as the previous game that cost $300 million for a single SKU on PlayStation. Um, and that's a lot of money, right? And that's a lot of risk. And so when you're taking that much financial risk on product, you're obviously unwilling to take a lot of product innovative risk, right? You don't no. want to, you're not going to put something out in the market that's going to be, that's going to push the envelope because you, you, you've, you've already got such a large investment, you're going to have to recoup on day one. So um, this may seem a little Pollyanna-ish, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think AI will be the great savior of the AAA games business. Because I do believe, despite a, my friends who tell me that there has never been a technological innovation in the games business that didn't result in increased costs, um, <laughs> which I understand from a kind of, you know, I, I understand the, that at, at, on a it's a little glib, but I understand it. Yeah. Um, but I do believe that the, that AI may prove to be the exception to that rule. So we want to talk a little bit about the games industry. So like on console, you had like they directly enable like a, yeah. a chose a dev to, kit. Yeah, put right. On. Yeah, you didn't get a dev kit. You didn't develop for the platform. Yeah, and then um, with Steam, it's been more of like just being the storefront, and then on mobile, obviously they've been like had control of the hardware. And there's the app store approval process. Yep. And, um, and then like the, all the like the data collection side. So I'm curious how you think that's going to evolve and how, the, how that's like shaped the game industry on all these different platforms and then how it evolves. I think it's always been a response to, to sort of negative occurrences in the industry. So I think a lot of the console yeah. control points evolved from the 1985 to 1987 crash yeah. in the video game business where the, there was a, a belief that loosening the content restrictions led to uh, this sort of superabundance of bad quality content and that 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 they had they risked their massive investment in hardware and in merchandising that hardware and merchandising the software that accompanied that hardware at retail yeah. by allowing you know et the extraterrestrial to get made for sega and nintendo um i think that's probably partially true on a certain level and so i i don't fault them for that response but like Nintendo obviously really closed up. Sega was a little bit more open during that period, and then um, and then it evolved and 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 the like. Um, I'm gonna be. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of this current period, yeah. because I think if there is a much more severe contraction than I'm currently predicting, and we're down over the next two to three years, twenty percent in terms of global revenues in the games business, that's going to be a really shocking event. And I think that kind of a spectacular event in the games business could lead to maybe more control points being implemented at, pl in, 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 at, the, at some of the larger platforms, mm -hmm. maybe higher levels of curation than we've currently seen. What, what do you think the, the games industry is going to contract in the next couple of years? Well, I think I, my prediction for the games industry is down flat to down 1% to 3% for the mm -hmm. next two years, basically. Um, and I don't know anything, so take that for what it's worth. It's one person's opinion. Um, 
but I have seen analysts who are much more gloomy than me and uh, who don't believe there's going to be an imminent recovery in China. And China is a real Mm -hmm. issue at the moment Um, in terms of consumer spending, in terms of, you know, glut of content, in terms of restrictions on the market from the foreign companies trying to, to distribute there. Uh, so I think that's that's a big open question going forward. I do think that you pointed to earlier this sort of glut of service content, for example, and venture funded content in general that's going to be coming to market, that's going to be competing for users with the incumbents. I think that's going to be, yeah. that's also potentially an issue. And I think the IDFA changes and all of the uh, European community and now as of this morning, uh, United States Justice Department scrutiny of Apple and Google, that's also going to have a, a chilling effect on the market. Oh, you think it'll be negative? Yeah, I think it'll be negative in the short term. Okay. Because I think it'll just kick the tires out from underneath a lot of existing businesses. Okay. If we have more time, I would challenge you on that. But I think I, I did want to ask about control point evolution in the future because you know, I think hardware played such an important point in game access that it was able to, uh, you know, control the industry. Uh, there's a few possible like areas that could be new control points of a, of okay. a type. So, you know, you've, you have like a Fortnite style content control point potentially with UEFN yeah. it becoming a hub. Maybe cloud owning a cloud service. Like, is is hardware still going to be important? Are Apple and Sony going to be okay if they don't have cloud services? How do you think about the, those dynamics? My umbrella theory for where this for for what's going to be valuable moving forward is always centered around audience aggregation that's kind of my north star for a lot of these things so if again as we talked about earlier if like playstation or xbox has that user aggregation and in their case they have a much smaller user aggregation. mean you look at something like fortnite or discord or other things like that they, they have way more active users than the consoles do and yet the consoles are these are incredibly lucrative because they have the right tens of millions of right. users on yeah, their the, platform, the right? Gamers and so want a game. So I, 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 it is nuanced. It's not an absolute number kind of game here, but on, on, on one level, it's all about that, right? And I think, as you mentioned, all of those potential user aggregations have the opportunity to potentially evolve into choke points. I mean, we've seen it even with Unity. Yeah. Right, where you wouldn't normally expect the engine to be uh, a surface area in the in the games business, capable of you know functioning as either a customer acquisition enabler or as a choke point or however you want whatever whatever terminology we want to adopt, and yet it has right. And so I think again the the difficulty of achieving those aggregations in a business where mass market advertising is essentially over. Right, like I mean, when when we were growing up, we would uh, I, I would advertise my PlayStation games in 1997, 1998 on Comedy Central on cable television. On we would buy television advertising. The idea of doing that today would be insane. Although weirdly enough, I did have a crazy conversation with an advertising executive from I, be, I think it was Kixi or Machine Zone at some point uh, a few years ago, and they had bought. A uh, Super Bowl ad with Kate Upton. I've, you yeah, remember was, this? Yeah, I think it was. Well, Supercell did. Supercell did one with um, Liam Neeson as well, famously, and they don't do. But what's old is new. I mean, brand advertising is the back yeah. in the movie. Well, industry, no, right? and he took me through the numbers, yeah. and he was basically like, "This is cheaper than Facebook advertising yeah. <laughs> in terms of the reach that I'm getting and the like." And I was, and I was kind of startled by that. And maybe you're right. Maybe well, everything that that is old is new again. Awesome. Last. Question. So uh, we're calling this podcast Secret Sash. So we want to know your secrets. And uh, maybe there's one you could share from the early days of why it's something that people don't know or another, maybe any, any amazing investment that you've done. Well, I feel like I've already told you so many of my secrets <laughs> in the course of this podcast. Yeah. But uh, I think the, um, probably the most interesting uh, secret of the early days of Riot was that um, one of the early investors um, had insisted on distributing the venture investment on a milestone basis, as if it were a publishing deal. Wow. You, yes, you, you, your, your mouth opens when I'm I say sure, yeah. <laughs> So what venture capitalist is qualified? I, I, to... I will not say, but, th- but nevertheless, this was, this was in place, and they were going to miss their milestone. And it's interesting because my wife, um, Cecilia, who's been in the video game business longer than me, 
um, and who was a who was a designer and director of games at Activision for many many years, and then ran their green light process for even more. Um, I sent her in to do diligence on Riot because she's been lied to by every development team in the industry, right? So she knew how to cut through the bullshit, and she she sat down with uh, Steve Snow, their their development director and their big design document and went through it page by page and came back and said, they're going to be six months late. And they were six months late to the day. Wow. And so I knew they were going to be six months late. And when they missed their milestones, I was able to come in armed with the knowledge that my wife, who was a savant about development scheduling, um, that the game would get done. Cause she said, look, this, they could do this. They have the team, they have the understanding, they will execute this game. They're just going to be six months late. And so I was able to come in and assure the board that it was fine and that we should not intervene and that we should just let them have the, the, the milestone payment. And to this day, Brandon and Mark think I did something heroic um, and, and saved Riot, when in fact it was complete nonsense. It was my wife who saved Riot by having identified that it was, uh, that it was, that it was an executable opportunity so i had heard the part of the story that you showed that your wife went in vetted them and gave you the okay that from from some very early riot employees they did not mention the six months late plot so maybe that's it yeah it's good to know that's all i got amazing thank thanks you so much thanks mitch that was amazing yeah cool. thank you so much